All right, all right. I keep hearing the ding ding. Just let me let everybody in. Yeah. Hey, B Rice. Trey here, Travis here, Lisa here, a bunch of autopilots, Jay Bird, Jason Lafferty, the Here Comes Granford. <laughs> Granford's joining in. Give everybody a few minutes to join on in. I'm going to skip the usual uh, quick wins that we do at the beginning. But I'll, I'll let somebody do one. One comment on a, a project that they've got to that they've got moving forward. I'm just going to let one person do one comment and we'll just do that for just a second. And it'll be the first one to start speaking. Go. Hi. Hi. Ah, you turkey you always win. All right. What I'll you got for us, Grant? I'll let somebody else go if they need it. Anybody else got something they want to report on a project? Some uh, something great going on? Then we'll let our uh, resident optimist, always positive, always got some great news. Granford, give us some good news, buddy. What you got going down? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I got my lease for the business site approved. I'm about to sign it. I got a bank account and everything going. I'm about to be ready to go. Awesome. Multiple business owner. Now um, selling mattresses, huh? Something like that. <laughs> Something like that. Next three to five years. Very good. Very, very good. So just like a lot of you have come from other masterminds, other groups, um, Granford was in one and he had already was kind of well down the road on it whenever he got in here and wanted to get into this on more of a passive. The one that he's doing with the mattresses is more active, which means you got to work. You got to be the salesman and all that kind of stuff. And of course, what we do, the goal is to be passive, which means we do a lot of work in the beginning. We get everything set up and then we become passive to where we just get that mailbox money. And we just get that check coming in every month. So that's the goal. That's what we're working towards. Tonight, I kind of put uh, a title on it. And it's, um, what did I actually say here? I'll actually look and see what it actually said. It had to do with imposter syndrome because we talked about that the other day. Confidence and overcoming imposter syndrome. So this is something we've talked about before in here, and it's been brought up a couple of times. Whenever you're dealing with investors, I'd say personally, number one most important thing is that you're confident. Number one. Like everything else, the numbers can be great. The numbers can be amazing. The presentation can be gorgeous. But if you don't present it with confidence, if you don't talk to your friends, family, business associates, investors, LPs, if you don't speak to these people and communicate to them confidently, <clears throat> all the numbers in the world are not going to save you. So today is a little bit more about like personal, inside, how we feel, how we think, how we spend our lives daily. And so that's how that's how we're going to work on building this confidence. If you already have it, hopefully we'll make it stronger. If you don't have it yet, we're going to get it. We're going to make it happen. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to watch a video together. And um, while we do that, I'll probably pause it in the middle, talk a little bit. And I think there are a lot of really great points in here that really go back to exactly what we've been talking about, confidence and imposter syndrome. Let's go back and review. Anybody who wasn't here the other day, who, who can give me a definition of imposter syndrome? Go ahead, Lisa. It's when you walk into a room with the feeling that you're not as good as other people other people and you don't have the confidence like it, I do it all the time every single time I go listen to a live speaker I'm like oh I'm gonna learn something and then I'm like I just paid them to do that I know way more than they do why in the world did I you know and then I, I don't know why I don't give myself enough credit for that and then when people say oh you're great at this or whatever I'm like really like and so it's like it's like you don't like recognize yourself as the expert 
like other people do. Am I right? Is that a good definition? That's a great definition. Thank you so much. I would say it's that um, you feel like you're faking in a room full of people who are not faking. And I heard a really good podcast and a friend of mine said this. He goes, it's boob jobs and Brazilian butt, whip, butt lifts all the way to the top. Everybody's faking it. Okay. So if you feel like you're the only one who's faking or making yourself more confident or trying to draw up the confidence in yourself to get rid of this imposter syndrome, to tamp it down, to get it under control, you know, all the people that I've talked to all the way up to the top, like we were talking about my friend Franz the other day, 100 million he, he manages dealing with people who manage 100 billion with a B. He still has to work on it. It's still a part of his life. You know, he's 10 years older than me. He's been doing this 20, 30 years. You know, I'm 20 years in this. And so it doesn't, it probably will not ever like completely go away, but you can learn to control it. You can learn to work on it. And a lot of the, the confidence building things that I talk about will help you with that. So let me share my screen. Give me one second. I'm going to pop over here, open this up, and then I will share my screen and we will watch it together. And I, like I said, I'm going to make some pauses in here and make some comments as we go. Okay, we'll do full screen. All right, let's listen in. Carl Jung talked about this phenomena, he cried phenomenon he described as retrogressive restoration of the persona it's a complicated idea but basically what it means is that sometimes you take a leap forward and you learn some things but you can't catalyze a new identity so you try to go back and hide in your old identity and that so, actually doesn't work does that sound familiar does that sound like what we're talking about you know you've gotten up to a certain point you've learned and you're now like in a new room you're in a You've got this new identity, but we want to run back and kind of hide in our old identity. Hang on, let me get out of here so I can admit there's Shalanda coming in. So don't do that. And let's talk about why. And that actually doesn't work because while things have changed and you've learned something and that isn't who you are anymore. And so it's like, you have to cut part, parts of yourself off in a destructive manner to fit back into the person that you were. Now, what happens here is that Pinocchio escapes from this tyrannical situation and undergoes this descent into chaos, but he tries to go back home. He tries to go back to where he was, and he can't do that anymore. His father isn't at home anymore. And so, so when he goes home, he finds that there's no home there. Now, this happens to people sometimes, and it's often a shock to them. So they often stay under the thumb of their father. And you think, well, why would someone do that? Because it means they're subject to the tyrannical judgment of their father. They're always concerned about what their father would think or whether their father approves of them, of them and so forth. And you think, well, that's got to be an unpleasant place to be. Why would you do that? Freud said, for example, that no, no, no one could be a man unless his father had died. And Jung said, yes, but that death can take place symbolically. Okay, so there's that part of the idea. And then another part of the idea is one of the times in your life when you actually realize that you're an individual is when you'll go and ask your parents something and you'll realize they actually don't know any more about what you should do than you do. And this is why I talk about don't guruize me, for example, or anybody, really. Because eventually you're going to come to me and there's going to be something that you, you've learned, you've broken through, and it's going to shine in your face saying this imposter syndrome thing, this thinking that I'm leaning on Alex's knowledge, I'm leaning on some other guru's knowledge, is false. So as you're, as you're learning, let me give a great example. Shalanda, I think she just popped in here. I, I'm very good at this cash flow portal thing that we use. It's how we deal with investors. It's a technology. She has focused in and concentrated her efforts on getting very, very good at this. 
And now she knows way more than I do about it. So now I have to lean back on her for her knowledge and ability. So she's come to me and become her own individual in this, in this skill, just as an example, you know, in this skill of running cash flow portal, which is one of the ways we deal with investors. And that sucks. And that's partly why people are often willing to maintain that tyrant slave relationship with their father. It's like, on the one hand, you have to be inferior in a relationship like that. You know, you've always got the judge watching you. But on the other hand, there's always someone who knows what to do. There's always someone standing between you and the unknown that you can go ask, what should I do? Well, at some point, you'll realize that the reason you can't ask that anymore is because they actually don't know any more than you do. And then that's a pain. Like that, that is a symbolic death. And that's also when you establish a more individual relationship with your parents. It's at that point that you could conceivably start taking care of them instead of the reverse. And that's a time that should come. And isn't that exactly what I just talked about? There comes a time when you grow so much as an individual that you can take care of your parents the way they once took care of you. Exactly the relationship Shalanda and I have right now. We've gotten to a point where she can take care of me in running cash flow portal better than I can take care of her in running cash flow portal. But you have to let that image of perfection go, and that exposes you. Well, that's what happens here. You know, Pinocchio goes home, and he wants things to be the way they work. And he wants to stay under the careful care of the benevolent father, but that's no longer possible. He's past that point, and that's why the father has disappeared. And so Geppetto has gone off to look for Pinocchio because he also needs his son, but, but in any case, the house is abandoned. And so then there, we see inside the house that everything's covered with cobwebs and everything's gone and Pinocchio and the cricket sit on the steps and they're very concerned. First of all, they wonder where he went. So they're actually concerned that he's gone, but they also don't know what to do because there's just no going home. And so, you know, that's also the case that once you hit a certain point in your development, well, it's the same thing we already talked about. The answers that you're looking for are not going to be found in your parents' house. It's as simple as that. Now, you could artificially maintain your dependency. But, you know, if you do that for too long, things get pretty ugly. And the Lord said unto Abram, and this is, this, is the, this is the opening of the story, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And this is one of those phrases where every clause is significant. Go somewhere you don't understand. That's the first thing. Get thee out of thy country. You know, back in the 1920s, there was a whole slew of American writers who ended up as expatriates in Paris, Hemingway among them, and a variety of others. It was very inexpensive in Paris at the time. And part of their transformation into great literary figures was the fact that they were out of their country. And now they could see what their country was, because you can't see what your country is until you leave it. So you have to go into the unknown. And that's, that's God's first command. Go into the unknown. Because you already know what you know. And so, and that's not enough unless you think you're enough. And if you're not enough and you don't think you're enough, then you have to go where you haven't been. And so that's the first commandment in Abraham. It's like, okay, that, that's a good one. That makes so, you know, whenever we go into these rooms, so to speak, that that's kind of a phrase that we use a lot. You know, you're going into a bigger room. You're going into uh, um, a situation where people probably know way more than you do. So probably the right thing to feel is imposter syndrome, inferior, like you don't know as much. But that's what you have to do to grow. That's exactly the way it works. That's the exact, exactly the way that you obtain this competence and confidence. So competence being competent at a skill or a task or a thought or a mentality or whatever it is, being competent at it builds that confidence one of the things i talked about all the time it was it was huge for me when i very first started out um not very first but let's see maybe eight years ago i'd fallen into a lull i'd fallen into kind of a low spot and i needed to build my confidence back up i felt terrible things had gone wrong 
personal, professional, family, everything, health, everything was bad, 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 bad. And the thing I did is I started to realize that if I get up at four o'clock in the morning and do nothing but focus on this one subdivision of lots here in Ocean View in, in Hawaii, I don't know if y'all, if you don't know my story, I was living in Hawaii. I was literally living in a van on food stamps, trying to get my life back together and being able to do nothing but just focus on that one thing. I, I could build a lot of confidence because I started to realize if I get up at four every morning and all day, every day, all I do is concentrate on this one task, this one subject, I will become the expert in that subject. I will become the the top. There's nobody that's going to be able to beat me whenever I just focus on this one thing all the time. And that's all I do. And that's how I built my confidence. And that's actually how I also built my competence because I became more competent at it. I became better at it because I was spending all my time focusing on one thing. That's how I became the best at it. That's how I wound up owning 100 one acre lots in, in Hawaii because I focused on that one thing It built up my ability, my competence. And that also strengthened my confidence. And I mean, you can feel really confident when you're like, man, I've been doing this for three years, four o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock at night, all day, every day. This is all I think about. This is all I do. It's all I talk about. It's all I read about. It's all I watch videos about. I don't watch TV. I don't listen to music. I don't do anything but this. I'm not suggesting you narrow your life that much, but that's a tool you can use at different times in your life. You can pull that tool out and use it to obtain competence and confidence. And so I got really, maybe too much, maybe cocky, right? Maybe, maybe thinking there's no way, but it, but it got to a point where it's like, it would be unreasonable for someone to start now and be able to beat me at this game. Because I've been doing it for three years, 4 a.m. to 8, 8, 8 p.m. every single day, seven days a week. That's all I do. That's all I think about. And it became to where it was just completely unreasonable that somebody could beat me at this game. And I tell you what, that'll build your confidence. That'll really build your confidence. It's perfect sense. Go to where you don't know. Yes. And for my kindred. Well, what does that mean? It means grow up. Right? That's what it means. It means get away from your family enough so that you can establish your independence. And that isn't because there's something wrong with your family. Perhaps there is, you know, as there is perhaps wrong with you. But it means get away. You know, I talk to people very frequently whose families have provided them with too much protection. And they know it themselves. And that means they're deprived of necessity. You know, one of the things that you see in, in the United States, for example, is that um, the children of first-generation immigrants often do better than, the than, than their children. And the reason for that is that the children of first generation Im immigrants have necessity driving them. And you don't know how much you need necessity to drive you because maybe you're not very disciplined. And if and a catastrophe doesn't immediately befall you if you don't act forthrightly today, then maybe you never act forthrightly, right? Because the, the, the gap between your foolishness and the punishment is, is lengthened by your unearned wealth. And so you never grow up and learn and you have to get yourself away from your dependency in order to allow necessity to drive you forward. And that's to become independent and to become mature. And I think part of what's happening in our culture is that the, the, the force that's attacking the, the forthright movement forward of young men in particular is afraid of the power of men because it's confused about the distinction between power and authority and competence. And a man who's, who has authority and competence has power as a byproduct, but the authority and competence is everything. And that's the important part I wanted to get back to. So the power, the leadership, the, the status, all of that comes from the competence, from being good at it, from doing it over and over and over. That's how you become competent at something. You focus on that one thing and you get really good at it the it's a byproduct you know the power of for example leading this group 
you know, being the facilitator of our mastermind, all of that gravitas or whatever it is, that power comes from the competence that I built over the years of doing this. The same thing you can do. You can follow my example. And I suggest you all I've ever done is follow other people's examples. Some of my videos that are coming out on Facebook, if y'all watch all those and YouTube and such. One of my very first business partners turned into a business partner slash mentor. And I literally just copycatted him like you would not believe. Every single thing that he said on a phone call to me, I wrote it down and I just copycatted. I didn't, I was just like, I'm just going to stay stupid and not try to figure out anything else except for just copy exactly what he's doing. And it worked. And, and, and people who can't understand that fail to make the distinction between power and authority and competence, and they're afraid of power, and so they destroy authority and competence. And that's a terrible thing because we need authority and competence. What else is going to, what else is going to allow us to prevail in the long run? And so you get away from your country and you get away from your kin and from your father's house, right? And you go out there and you establish yourself in the world. It's a call to adventure. That's what this, the, the first lines in the Abrahamic story is a call to adventure. Peter Pan is this magical boy. Pan means, Pan is the god of everything, roughly speaking. And so it's not an accident that he has the name Pan. And he's the boy that won't grow up. And he's magical. Well, that's because children are magical. They can be anything. They're nothing but potential. And Peter Pan doesn't want to give that up. Why? Well, he's got some adults around him, but the main adult is Captain Hook. Well, who the hell wants to grow up to be Captain Hook? First of all, you've got a hook. Second, you're a tyrant. And third, you're chased by the dragon of chaos with the clock in its stomach, right? The crocodile. It's already got a piece of you. Well, that's what happens when you get older. Time has already got a piece of you. And eventually, it's got a taste for you. And eventually, it's going to eat you. And so Hook is so traumatized by that that he can't help but be a tyrant. And then Peter Pan looks at traumatized Hook and says, well, no, I'm not sacrificing my childhood for that. So that's fine, except he ends up king of lost boys in Neverland. Well, Neverland doesn't exist. And who the hell wants to be king of the lost boys? And he also sacrifices the possibility to help a real relationship with a woman, because that's Wendy, right? And she's kind of conservative, middle class, London dwelling girl. She wants to grow up and have kids and have a life. She accepts her mortality. She accepts her maturity. So let me pause right there and talk about this Peter Pan concept. You know, I was telling you about whenever I was living in Hawaii, things had gone poorly. And like I said, I wound up living in a van. But... I was also at the beach, so there was a time when I was kind of comfortable with it because I was like, I get to just like be a little bit more like Peter Pan. A lot less responsibilities. I don't have to work so hard because I don't have rent to pay. It becomes a lot easier, but it, it you can just get stalled out and too comfortable of that life. Now, for me, it, personally, it was an extreme example. But that's what I'm trying to show you is an extreme example. Maybe it's a smaller example in your life. Maybe you're too comfortable with some things that you could be pushing yourself to learn more, to focus more, to become better, to become more competent so that you build the confidence and the authority and the power that comes along as a byproduct of your competence. Peter Pan has to content himself with Tinkerbell. She doesn't even exist. She's like, she's like the fairy of porn. She doesn't exist. She's the substitute for the real thing. And so, but the dichotomy that you're talking about is very tricky because there's a sacrificial element in maturation, right? You have to sacrifice the pluripotentiality of childhood for the actuality of a frame. And the question is, well, why would you do that? Well, one reason is it happens to you whether you do it or not. You can either choose your damn limitation or you can let it take you unaware when you're 30 or even worse when you're 40. And then that is not a happy day. You see, I see people like this and I think it's more and more common in our culture because people 
can put off mat maturity without suffering an immediate penalty. But all that happens is the penalty accrues. And then when it finally hits, it just wallops you. Because when you're 25, you can be an idiot. It's no problem. Even when you're out in the job search, it's like, well, you don't have any experience and you're kind of clueless. It's yeah, yeah you're young. You know, it's no problem. You can, that's what young people are like, but they're full of potential. Okay, well, now you're the same person at 30. It's like people aren't so thrilled about you at that point. It's like, what the hell have you been doing for the last 10 years? Well, I'm just as clueless as I was when I was 22. Yeah, but you're not 22. You're an old infant, right? And that's an ugly thing, an old infant. So the, the re part of the reason you choose your damn sacrifice, because the sacrifice is inevitable, but at least you get to choose it. And then there's something that's, that's even more complex than that in some sense is that the problem with being a child is that all you are is potential. And it's really low resolution. You could be anything, but you're not anything. So then you go and you adopt an apprenticeship, roughly speaking. And then you become, at least you become something. And when you're something, that makes the world open up to you again. You know, like if you're a really good plumber, then you end up being far more than a plumber, Like right? You end up being a good employer. Not, not the plumbers. I'm not putting plumbers down. It's like more power to plumbers. They've saved more lives than doctors. So hygiene, right? So, you know, if you're a really good plumber, well, then you have some employees, you run a business, you, 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 make, you, you train some other people, you enlarge their lives, you're kind of a pillar of the community, you, you have your family. It's, you can, once you pass through that narrow training period, which narrows you and constricts you and develops you at the same time, then you can teach. Do you hear that? It narrows you and it constricts you. So like, that's kind of what this course, you know, what we're doing together here. You know, we're focusing in on this one subject. And like I talked about before, there are plenty of masterminds where you can learn like a general, large, broad kind of commercial real estate, for example. And then you come and you focus in and it constricts you and it makes it to where you're focused on one specific subject. And that's what develops you. So you're developing this large knowledge at first and then you come and you constrict and you focus, and that's what develops you. Come out the other end with a bunch of new possibility at hell. At hell. Well, there you go. That was the end of that. All right. So a lot of times, like I've been telling y'all lately, it's just me talking at y'all. I'm hoping that we can kind of open up some discussion and get like some questions, some comments on this topic. <laughs> Anybody got something to say? I can say something. Please do. Yeah. Um, I think looking back on my life so far, which I wish I can go back. Uh, I think one of the things that I, I am good at is uh, I'm good at grinding. Um, you know, I might take breaks, but I always come back and I get back to the grind. And uh, you know, without grind, you got nothing. And if you don't like it, you're not going to get very far. So you got to got to be able to embrace the suck as they say and do what uh, other people aren't willing to do that's right and so that's what i call that's a that's a tool and so i talk about this all the time not every tool is correct for every job you don't use a wrench when you need a hammer because you're going to ruin your wrench you're going to ruin your tool for one so like grinding is a tool that you can use during certain times for certain projects time periods, whatever it is. I personally did it for many years, exactly what Travis is talking about. But there comes a time where what got you here is not gonna get you there. And so just grind, 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 gets you to a certain point and then it becomes, okay, now I need to learn to talk to people and to strategize and to do this administration that I've been putting off for all this time and learn how corporations work and bank accounts work and investments work and interest works. So just grinding all the time will get you quite far. It'll, it'll get you somewhere. And part of that grind builds the competence we've been talking about, the ability. And that builds the confidence as well. Thanks, Travis. Who has something else to say?
Everybody learned it all already. We already said it all at the beginning. I want to remind y'all, this is y'all's mastermind. It's your time. And that's, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm here for you. And I, I want you to give some input or ask some questions or lead the discussion, drive the discussion with me. Hey, Roland. Hey, Alex. Hey, bud. I actually I didn't know about your story. I'm glad you shared that uh, specifically. Um, I think for me, I'm drawn to people who are who have suffered like more than average and who are especially like someone who's living like you were in a van out there and kind of just I'm I'm glad you mentioned that it was something that you could potentially be just be comfortable with and be like, oh, this is good enough. Like I have food and I'm fine and I have access to, a, you know, a beach. This is the life. But I think uh, for me, what I took from that was that there's something nagging inside, like, no, nah, this is not where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be somewhere else. And uh, I feel that right now, like, I feel like I could be totally comfortable. Like I could just throw off my retirement and, you know, exist. But uh, I feel like I have too much to give. And this isn't to like talk myself up, but rather to uh, come to the realization that, um, like, why am I doing this? Well, it's because there's there's a lot more that I have to offer. And what that is, I don't really know, but I'm at least trying. I'm trying to figure out how to harness that that energy and how to harness that drive into something that's useful that helps people. And um, I think that's what, um, like for me, real estate investing is is like you're not just it's not like a mindless entity or I'm sorry, a faceless mm -hmm. entity where we're just you know making money to make money. We're actually helping people, and um, that gives me that gives me the energy to keep to keep pushing forward. But yeah, thanks for sharing that. I didn't, I didn't know that about you. Yeah. And it's, um, that, that purpose you're talking about. That's another great tool that you can use pretty much almost. It's like one of those tools you can use all the time. It's like one of those linear tools that, that just stays with you through the line of your life. As you set a purpose and you just stick to that purpose. And that's what becomes a mission statement. That's what becomes core values. Those are, that becomes like your motto, your family crest. These things that we think of that are kind of like ethereal, maybe they're like old school, ancient ideas, or maybe like a mission statement is like what a big corporation does. Well, one of the things I've talked about here before is those big corporations, they didn't become big and rich and powerful and have like 98% profit margin like Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola didn't become rich and powerful and then come up with mission statement, core values. They had those core values. That's why they became 98% profit margin. So those are some of the things to think about in your business and in your personal life is come up with, this is a little bit off of what we're talking about tonight, but it, it does build up your confidence and your ability to speak to investors and to overcome this imposter syndrome that we keep talking about is to have something written down. And I suggest write it down. You know, I have a personal mission. I have a personal mission. I have a business mission statement. And the business mission statement is to own 150 RV parks, the $2 billion asset under management value of a fund. Okay. That's the business part. The personal part is I'm trying to help 1 million fathers connect more deeply and emotionally with their children through the power of these outdoor camping experiences. That's what happened to me. That's what I see every single time I'm at a campground and I see children playing with their parents. And especially just I probably because I notice it because, you know, I'm a guy, I'm a father. So I, I see that and I see that connection with the children. I see that connection between a father and a child and how that connection chemically bonds the mother and father together when the mother sees the father connecting with the child. It's chemical. And so that became like a personal mission for me. And that's why that's that purpose that, that leads all the way through and it helps me make decisions. And it also brings confidence. So whenever I'm talking to investors, you know, a lot of times we'll be just digging into numbers and numbers and numbers over and over and over. And eventually I'll stop and I'll, you know, we'll kind of get into a discussion like we're talking about now and say like, well, 
what are you guys doing this for? Why, why are you investing money? Why, why are you trying to have this money go to something? What's the purpose? Is it just to have more money so you can buy a Rolex or want a fancy car or a bigger house? Or what is it that you want? What's the real purpose behind it? And having that personal mission statement, which I highly suggest, you create your business mission statement and core values and your personal mission statement and core values. I told you all recently I changed mine. Mine used to be tenacity, integrity, persistence, service. And that sounds real military, right? It kind of carried over from my military. It was a tool I used for a whole long time. I say probably 10 years. That was my personal core values. Tenacity, integrity, persistence, service. I thought about it all the time. I have it in my Google Calendar to where every single day it pops up and I see it. So that means I read it every single day. Same thing with the mission statement. But what got me here will not get me there. What got you here will not get you there. There are always these new skills. And that's one of the other ways to kind of overcome this imposter syndrome. Is because what got you into the room, those same skills, That's maybe that's why you feel like an imposter. Because you're using these old skills that got you there. And now it's time to learn the new skills that are going to get you there from where you've gotten to now. So currently I've changed it. And, you know, you think tenacity and integrity and persistence are hard and service is hard. I've changed it to something that to me is way harder. And it's kindness, courtesy, communication, and connection. And so to me, that's way harder because I've trained myself for so many years to have all that grind Travis was talking about, that tenacity, that push through. Well, whenever you're just pushing through, you're, it's, it's like you're a tank. You're just pushing everything out of the way. Well, that's not going to get me to where I have 10, 20 people listening to me talking on a mastermind working together on acquisition teams to where we can buy RV parks two or three per month. Just being tenacious and pushing people out of my way, that's not gonna create a team that works together to accomplish bigger goals. So I had to take on for myself new, different, and because I was an imposter whenever I got kind of into this room or whatever section that we're in, you know? For example, I, I talk about the Ritz. I used to go to the Ritz Carlton every uh, last Tuesday of the month. There's a big mixer that's there. It's all the top M&A attorneys in town. It's all the top, um, you know, very, very, very wealthy people, like very, very wealthy and very high income earners, like 500,000 per month, $3 million per month income earners. And so, yeah, I was an imposter in that room. And here I am, you know, I'm like using my tenacity and I'm using my persistence. And that's like, you know, and they're looking at me like, oh, well, you're a kid. You're, you're, using, you're using old school, old methods that got you into here. But those skills are not going to get you from here to the next room. And so being there, that's, that's one of the things that, oh, man, it killed me at first. This imposter syndrome we're talking about, I'd be trying to talk to an investor. And all I'd be talking about is how hard I work and how I'm there every single day. And they're like, well, I don't want to. I don't want to be like you. Working my butt off every day all the time. What's the point of that? I want to communicate and connect with people so that we can work together and do things easily. Much more easily than if I were doing them by myself, just only using my tenacity. So yeah, I, I've switched up and, and don't be afraid to go ahead and change your core values as you're noticing maybe maybe the imposter syndrome, if it's really, really strong, maybe that's a good key to look back and say, maybe these tools I'm using are not getting me from here to there. They got me from there to here where I was before to where I am now, but these same skills are not getting me to the next room. Thanks, Roland. Lisa, I saw you popped off a of mute. Did you have something to say? Yeah, I was just going to kind of add to what you said. I've kind of gone through the same thing in my life. Um, you know, like I literally, you wouldn't know from all the stuff I've got going on right now, but like about 
about four years ago, actually in 2018, 17, 18, 19, around there, I had every single thing that I'd ever put on my wish list. I had a beautiful house, yacht, Ferrari, like all the stuff that you could ever want. I had a great marriage. I got more kids, like everything I ever wanted. And I was, I, I had a coach that asked me, he was like, well, what's your big why? Like, why, you know, like he's trying to recruit me to Keller Williams. And I was like, I don't have any reason to work. <laughs> why would I want to? I've already got everything. And I was way too young to feel like that. I started thinking about maybe retiring even. And so just the idea of like changing what, like, and it's funny because now all my life is focused on experiences over material things. And all I want to do is get rid of so many of those material things and build a life around what now I want, which is the freedom to travel and to be able to earn a passive income. And that's super important to me, but also to leave a legacy for my children um, and have something that they can, you know, have for me for the rest of their lives that leaves a legacy for, for me. And it took me a good while to figure that out. And one more quick thing that I'll add, you know, I'm 52 years old and I'll be honest, like when I was, I've been doing real estate for 20 years, I'm probably sold, sold thousand homes. I was probably working like two or three hours a week, making $300,000 a year because I had my team and all my systems and processes, everything so streamlined. And now I'm rebuilding a whole entire business again at the age of 52 and, and there's growing pains with all of that. And I know I'll get to the, that point place again but I was watching um a master class so like I had my I bought the, the master class um app if you don't have it it's really great uh, it's a great gift for somebody my husband gave it to me for Christmas and I watched all the cooking shows on there and then I started watching one with uh, the Kardashians mom what's her name Sharon uh for Jenner I think um and uh, about personal branding and about her, her thing and the one thing that stuck out to me the most out of her whole personal branding thing was that the very first Kardashians show launched when she was 52 years old, which is what my age is, you know, now. And she built, they built a billion dollar empire, right? From the time she was 52 years old with her family to all of that and personal branding. And, and I just was like, well, I'm not, I'm not ready to retire. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm only 52 give me five more years, you know? So I think just kind of just basically re reiterating like what you said, like your goals can change. And it sounds like everybody's had like a different career path before this. And this is something new and um, it's exciting to work together with everybody. But um, I just wanted to like, let you know, like I've been through the exact same things and some people, their goals, like, I mean, Granford is so like young and he's like, oh, yay. And I remember when I was that age, just starting out, you know, like in real estate and all of that drive and energy. And then I got to that place. And I think it's just like something that I've learned through my life is you got to just keep making, setting more goals and finding out what you really want, as opposed to just monetary or whatever. Like it's all a life balance, which mine yeah. is out of balance again, but <laughs> Yeah. And that's the thing. It, it gets that way. It gets out of balance. So kind of similar to what you're talking about, whenever you get all your systems and your procedures and everything in place, this happens to me. And I've started to, I've talked to a ton of entrepreneurs about this. I, I did a lot of podcasts before I was, I was interviewing like three to five entrepreneurs per week, mostly real estate, but very, very, very successful people. Exactly what you're talking about, Lisa, Ferraris, house, yacht, all the stuff, right? And, um, you know, they felt the same way. Like, you're a human and they're a human. Humans have very, very, very similar emotions. You know, so if someone is much more wealthy, successful, powerful than you, they have the same emotions. And so... These folks all felt the same way that I felt, and now I've recognized it, and now I see it in patterns in my life. Every six to 10 months, I get all of my systems in place. I get everything dialed in to where it's like you're talking about two, three hours a week. Like if I really didn't want to work this week, I could probably I could probably be on this call and like one hour, two hours of work this week can be done. 
because all the systems are in place. Everything is happening. And so whenever that happens for me personally, it's like, whoa, what's going on? All of a sudden my schedule is empty and I start worrying about what's going on. And it's almost like a different kind of imposter syndrome. It's like, do I just, do I deserve all this success? Do I deserve all these, you know, accolades or payments or whatever is happening? <clears throat> but now I've recognized that. And whenever I feel it coming on, like literally, I just talking about it, I feel my body is hot. I feel sweaty. I feel like super nervous and 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 agitated by that feeling of. What the heck is going on? All of a sudden, my schedule is empty. I have no calls today. And then I look at my week and I'm like, I have one call this week. That's all I have. And it feels like everything's falling apart. And so some of you, as you're going through this, you're going to start to set up all these systems. And you might look at it and you will you might see that it might become a pattern in your life the same way it has in mine. Every six to 10 months or so, probably freak out a little bit for hopefully it'll get to be shorter and shorter amounts of time. At first it was like a couple of weeks, I'd be freaking out. I'm like, what is going on? Start overeating, skipping exercise, sleeping in late, all kinds of just bad habits. And eventually I started to realize, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is what's supposed to happen. I'm supposed to work hard and get all these systems in place. I'm supposed to learn how to communicate and connect with people so that I can help build a team. And that's what's supposed to happen is the result, the byproduct of doing all those right things, learning to communicate, connect, be kind. That's the hard one for me. I'm, I'm always tough on myself, so I'm tough on other people too. I had one of the members of the group the other day we got on a call. He goes, hey, man, are you mad at me? I'm like, no. And and I, you know, my fiance has been telling me this lately. She's like, look, I hear you on calls. You have got to calm down and talk to people kinder. And she's like, it's in your schedule. She sees my schedule. She's like, it's in your schedule. Kindness, courtesy. <laughs> Kindness is the first one. And so, you know, even though it's part of my core values, it's also something I'm constantly working on, you know? All right, I'll open it up. Anybody else got something we want to talk about? Jay, I, can you go ahead? I, I would say if kindness is something that you work on, uh, I, I would say that you're doing pretty well, uh, you know, especially from um, us at Econ, our Recon Equity, you know, we we get a lot of your time and, and we've um, we've gone through, you know, a lot these last couple of months and lots of it were <clears throat> even frustrated. Um, and I think from an outside looking in, you know, it's always in a manner of, um, you know, we may not always see eye to eye, but we're all trying to get to the same outcome. And so as something that um, I would have never looked at it as that something that you had to work hard to do, because it seems like it comes pretty naturally, even in, you know, some of our stressful, frustrating um, uh, times that we've had in the last couple of months. Thank you, Shalama. So the the key to me was the courtesy part. You know, the kindness kind of has been growing from the courtesy part. And I didn't just throw these words together just because they all start with, you know, it's kind of sound good. You know, kindness, courtesy, communication, connection. I didn't just throw them together because they sound good. They were the things that I noticed that were lacking in my life. They were lacking in my personality to work on. And so just for me personally, and you might notice this also as you're working on core values, one might grow from the other. For me, kindness grew from courtesy. Almost, pro I hope, I hope I'm still doing this. Every single email and text that you get from me should say please and thank you. I write please and thank you in chat GPT. 
how silly is that? I'm talking to a computer. <laughs> I'm telling it, will you please now write me blah, 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 blah. But my, you know, whatever kindness that is coming has grown from that. So whenever you're writing yours down, and please write them down. I cannot stress that enough. Write it out somewhere. If you use Google Calendar or whatever calendar you use, I put it into to just be there every day to pop up. <clears throat> so I don't have a choice but to read it. A lot of people will take and put it on a sticky note and put it on their computer, put it on your mirror, whatever those core values are so that you see it every day. And and try to as you're as you're setting them up, maybe one of them seems very lofty, like a really lofty goal, like kindness. Well, I, I literally knew that courtesy would develop kindness. <clears throat> and so I put them both in there. And that's how it worked for me. So whenever you're writing your own, pay attention to that and see if there's a way that you can have one help you develop the other. Because courtesy is something that's just, you can just do it. You don't have to like grow that inside of you. You can just say please and thank you. Yes or no, sir. You you can be curt some you you start talking at the same time, you go ahead. That's just an action you can take. And I feel like maybe kindness is more of a feeling. It's more of a feeling that you're portraying to other people or expressing to other people through the way that you speak to them. But the courtesy for me was the key to the kindness. So if you've got one that's like more lofty, kind of ethereal, kind of like a mentality, try to find something that's concrete that you can do every day that can help you to grow that more mentality. Concrete actions create mentality. A lot of people think it, it works the other way. <clears throat> I'm gonna have this kindness mentality and that's gonna make me be courteous, maybe. I mean, the real way to do it is to force yourself to be courteous and it'll grow that kindness. There's probably something like that in your core values as well. Hey, Sonny, good to see you, bud. Hey, hey everybody. Um... So I, I know I logged in at the bottom of the hour and I know I kind of missed the premise before that, um, but I've been listening into since and I wanted to chime in about your, your past, your recent comments about the, the courtesy and kindness. But I also wanted to add, um, you know, empathy as one of the other um, things that we need to, uh, at, least, at least for me, because I've uh, kind of noticed that when I talk to and when I'm networking with these investors, uh, I got to put myself in their shoes and understand where, like, their level of understanding and then go from there. You know, I've, I've had to revamp the slides, our uh, five or six C slides, and then kind of, you know, go back to, to like, you know, the baby steps. Of what is commercial real estate? That type. So, I mean, that's that's another thing that I wanted to add to the conversation. Awesome. Thank you, Sonny. Hey, let's get some feedback from the rest of the group. What is, say Sonny, let's just do an exercise. Say Sonny were to be writing out new core values for himself. And one of them that he wanted to have would be empathy. That would be like kindness. That would be like the mentality, right? <clears throat> from the group, what are some physical steps he could take every day that he could put into his core values to develop empathy? Little acts, baby steps. <clears throat> Good. Maybe listening. Yep, agree with that. Help them out, folks. Let's come up with some, some, let's throw a bunch out. Everybody try to throw one out if you can. One more. Connecting. Connecting with you. Good. Thank you, Roland. Taking away all of the pre, you know, like the preconceived notions about about people in general, and then just listening, you know. I think listening is going to be a good one for you. Lisa, I saw you pop off a mute. 
Yeah, I missed the question because my computer froze. <laughs> <laughs> what we're trying to do is we're trying to help Sonny come up with, you know, one of the things he mentioned is he said he wants to be more empathetic because as he's dealing with investors, what he's realizing is he needs to empathize with the fact that they don't even know what commercial real estate is. And here he's going, 506 C, 16% return on, you know, all this kind of thing. And he needs to be more empathetic. So let's try to help him find, say, just as an exercise as a group, say he were to be writing his own core values and empathy was like the mentality at the end of it he's working on. What would be some physical steps, some, some habits that he could do every day to help develop and grow that empathy? <clears throat> you can subscribe to uh, Stephen Covey, seek to understand before being understood. I mean, a lot of those things, uh, you know, you just have to ask the right questions and uh, asking the right questions is actually the hard part. I like that. Seek to understand. That's part of the listening, right? Not just listening, but active listening and really trying to understand what's going on with that other person. That creates that connection. That creates that open-ended questions and trying to define the space. Talk about that some more, Travis. What about open-ended questions? <laughs> uh, you know, it's like everything else in life. You know, you're trying before you can take a step forward. You got to figure out uh, where, you know, how the battlefield is laid out. You know, you put it that way. Um, you know, so yeah, you find yourself asking all kinds of questions when you go into the unknown, and you're like, okay, well, what is this unknown? How do I figure out? How do I match this material? You know, and if your material is other people or if it's other investors, well, then th those are a different set of questions. What do they know? What don't they know? You know, where are they at? How mature are they? You know, how how risk? What's their risk tolerance and time horizon? You know, um, it's like when we were talking to uh, one of the one of the lead investors on another property. And I was talking. I compare that to uh, talking to uh, one of my coworkers about this. I could tell the difference because this guy knew that we had a massive IRR and he was okay with it. But this guy over here, he's like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. I don't I don't understand. And um, therefore, fuck you. So I was like, okay, well, I see the difference here. This guy's comfortable with it and you're not. And I, I couldn't close the gap, so. Yeah. I think a big one is that it, that it comes back to the, the listening and the understanding of the other person. And that's a very giving thing, wouldn't you say? Like, we can take it back and make it into more concrete steps like, Talk less, listen more. I can say that uh, lately, what I've been listening to Huberman Lab, right? There's three Paul Conti, Dr. Paul Conti, he's a psychiatrist, and he's been kind of helping me reframe a lot of things with myself and uh, with other people and, and what they go through and how they define things with respect to themselves, um, you know, with the dependencies or the, the mental thoughts. It's, uh, I find myself thinking differently just because I keep listening to those three episodes. Yeah, Paul Conti is great. You can just go on YouTube for free and listen to tons of information. Andrew Huberman, go and listen to his podcast and you're gonna learn a lot of medical, mental, neuroscience. And Conti is more, uh, what would you say, like meditation and such, yeah? Yeah, just the way he the, the the way he uses his words, it's pretty mind blowing, and I find myself using those words the same kind of way, and it's just helping me reframe things. It's pretty impressive. Um, it takes several listenings. So very good. That kind of goes back to what we've been talking about lately, as far as like uh, listening to podcasts to be feeding your mind. Like one of the ones I was suggesting a couple of weeks ago, uh, my first million or the All In podcast. That's all numbers and statistics and economy and global economics and all that kind of stuff. So that's going to feed into your mind and it'll be coming out of your mouth here in a minute because you're, you're hearing it and you're listening to it and you're thinking about it. So more on this emotional side, same thing. If you're listening to feeding your mind with podcasts, YouTube channels, whatever it is, that are talking about how to improve yourself, how to improve your emotions, how to improve how you deal with yourself and how you deal with your emotions. I think that's really gonna help you out. Okay, we've reached the end of the hour and um, let's see, I'll be back on Tuesday. I got some calls, I'll see you tomorrow, Roland. Brian, book a call with me, let's talk some more. Jason, we got a call coming up on Wednesday. 
Shalanda, did we book a call? Awesome. Alex, did you hear anything back from Utah? Um, actually, just today, yeah. Uh, we got a real strong maybe. <laughs> okay. So I they just know. haven't had time. I mean, the the contract that I sent them was you know ten pages long, okay. and it was uh, very strong to protect our interests. I'll just kind of let the cat out of the bag a little bit. Lisa and I are working on a project. These guys already have one point four million dollars into it. We can start on it May first. And probably within six months, turn that into $20 million. With the budget that I have for them, that'll only take us up to about $2.2 million. So they will have invested $2 million and we're going to turn it into 20. And I mean, that's a pretty awesome return, wouldn't you say? And then there's going to be years and years and years of income for Lisa, for them, for Lisa's realtor, for Lisa's business for many, many, many years. So we got a real strong maybe on that one. Do a little prayer, a little up to Allah, whoever you. Bye-bye. Night.